Okay, good. I think we're ready to go. So we're going to start talking about parallel regions, which are the fundamental concept in OpenMP. So we saw this a little bit already last week. So the parallel region directive works like this. So the code within a parallel region is executed by all threads. So if we remember from last time, when an OpenMP program starts executing, the um, master thread begins execution on its own. So that's the sequential part of the program. When the first parallel region is encountered, it creates a team of threads, and the team of threads executes the block of code inside the parallel region. So here's the syntax. In Fortran, it's exclamation mark dollar OMP parallel, followed by a block of code, and then exclamation mark dollar OMP end parallel to finish the parallel region. In C or C++, the syntax is hash pragma OMP parallel, and then we have the block of code in curly braces. Um, so just an important thing to note here for C and C++ programmers, the opening curly brace must come on a new line. It cannot come immediately after the parallel. Um, otherwise, the code does not parse correctly as a, C, as a plain old C program. So um, that's uh, a bit unfortunate because um, a lot of C programmers are used to using that kind of style. You put the curly brace after, for example, a, a, an if or a for uh, keyword, and and then and then close the brace lower down. For a, for a parallel region, the the opening brace must be on a on a new line. Okay, so my examples are going to be a mixture of Fortran and C. Um, so I hope that they're easy enough that you can, depending on which is your favorite language, you can easily enough translate from, from one to another for yourselves. Okay, so here's a very simple example again of a parallel region. So. Um, we're in C this time. So the code is on the, here on the left. So we start off with a call to Fred, which is going to be executed by the master thread because that's outside the parallel region. We then have a parallel region and the block of code that it contains is a call to Billy. So in this instance, I've and on the right, four threads, and all four threads will make that call to Billy. At the end of the parallel region, so that's the closing curly brace, the master thread waits for all the other three threads to finish executing Billy. So we have to remember that they may not all take the same time to do this, depends what's inside that function. The master thread waits for them all to finish at the end of the parallel region. Uh, once they've all arrived, then the master thread carries on executing. So it will, it will then call Daisy. Uh, again, we're back in the sequential part of the program where the execution is on one thread only, which is the master thread. So in general, it's uh, if we're going to do something useful with just a plain old parallel region, then it's not, not very interesting if uh, every thread executes precisely the same code. All we've achieved is we've managed to replicate the same block of code on, on all threads, um, which probably isn't very useful. So in order to be able to do different computations on different threads. 
and also to figure out how many threads there are. There are a couple of useful runtime library functions. So the first one of these is OMP get num threads. So I've shown both, both the Fortran and C syntax for this function here. Um, so in order to access the OpenMP runtime library functions in Fortran, we, in, we have a use statement with the OMP underscore lib module. Okay, so that's where, uh, and that name OMP underscore lib is defined in the standard. So that'll be the same for all compilers. So by including that module in Fortran, that includes the definitions for all the OpenMP runtime library functions. And similarly in C and C++, it's, uh, it's a header file. It's the OMP.h header file. So if we hash include the OMP.h header file at the, at the, big, at the start of the, the uh, file, then we get access to all the definitions for the OpenMP library functions in C or C++. So what this actually, what this function actually does is that it will return the number of threads currently executing in the enclosing parallel region. So the question is, what happens if we call this function from outside a parallel region? Uh, and the answer is that it returns one. Okay. So the logic being that outside a parallel region, thread executing, which is the master thread. So this function will return one if we call it outside parallel region. So um, it's, it, it does make sense, but it's easy to get caught out by that. So the other thing we might want to do in order to be able to do useful parallel work inside a parallel region is to find out the number of the executing thread. Okay. So uh, this function is OMP underscore get underscore thread underscore num. And this takes values starting from zero up to one less than what OMP get num threads returns. So thread numbers always start from zero. Um, so Fortran programmers, just beware. If you end up using the thread number to index an array, you may be unpleasantly surprised because your array indexes start from one, but thread numbers always start from zero. So, we need to specify other instructions to the parallel region typically. So we can give in additional information about, for example, about shared and private data uh, through clauses. And these are extra bits of syntax that appear on the end of the parallel. Uh, and they can be either separated by commas or spaces. So one of the things that we can do with this is to specify shared and private variables. So if you remember from last week, we talked about uh, inside a parallel region, variables can either be shared. So in other words, all threads see the same copy or they can be private where each thread has its own copy. And the clauses we have there are shared, private, and default clauses. So the default clause determines the behavior of everything that's not in, not explicitly in a shared or private list. Um, so the syntax is 
pretty straightforward. It's, for example, for shared, it's shared and then a comma separated list of variable names in brackets and the same for private. And then the default behavior can either be shared or private or none. Okay. At least for Fortran anyway, in C and C++, we don't get the option of default private. And this is for obscure technical reasons. with the fact that C has some internal variables. So uh, things like Erno, for example, um, and for also things like file descriptors and so on. And it just turns out that for technical reasons, it's difficult to support um, default private in, in C++ without, without having some unexpected and unpleasant effects. So how does this work? Okay, so if we have a shared variable, then any reference to that shared variable inside the parallel region is just to the same storage as originally existed before the parallel region started. So nothing happens. Every thread accesses the original and existing memory location and storage for that variable. For private variables, then what happens is that every thread gets a new copy of that variable on entry to the parallel region. And these private copies are uninitialized. So it's our responsibility as programmers to make sure that private variables are always initialized before they are used. If we declare a variable inside the scope of a parallel region, then those are automatically private. And in fact, we can't list those in the private clause because they're not in scope at that point. And for private variables after the parallel region ends, the original variable is unaffected by any changes that have been made to the private copies. So the original storage variable persists. You can't access that storage from inside the parallel region, and at least not directly. Uh, and its, its value is not changed by any modifications to the private copies. So this mechanism also all works for C++ objects. If we declare a private object, then we get a new copy which is created using the default constructor. Now, it's a very important point about default clauses. If you don't specify a default clause, then that's the same as specifying default shared. Now, this maybe looks like an odd decision. And in fact, it's, you know, if, if you had to ask me, I would say this is the single worst design decision in OpenMP, is this behavior. Okay. Um, this is dangerous, okay? So uh, having, having every variable shared by default is a recipe for having race conditions and non-deterministic behavior because it's very easy to overlook a variable which ought to be private and if you leave it as shared by default then you will have race conditions so this is dangerous so i recommend that you always always specify default none on parallel regions so what this does is that it forces you to declare every variable that's accessed 
inside the parallel region as either shared or private, or there's a couple of other options which we'll come to soon, but it forces you to, to declare it as uh, declare its behavior uh, and not leave it up to the compiler to determine it. So that makes sure that you think carefully about the data, sh data sharing attributes of every variable in the parallel region. So I just I cannot commend the use of this strongly enough. Um, uh, if you don't do it, then sooner or later one of these one of these nasty bugs will come and bite you. What happens in practice if you have if you specify default none? and then you miss out a variable so there's a variable that doesn't appear in one of these shared or private clauses you will get a compiler error so the compiler will fail the compiler will fail and you'll get an error message and most compilers are pretty good about telling you uh, which variables you missed so it's um you know it's a reasonable it, it turns out that that doing this gives you a reasonable workflow if you if you put in default none uh, and then if you accidentally miss out a variable from one of from one of these shared or private clauses then the compiler will complain in a sensible way saying you declared this variable and the compilation fails Okay, so now let's look at a very simple example of a, a piece of code uh, that uses uh, shared and private variables. So all this code does, uh, and it's a little bit contrived, is that each thread is going to initialize a different column of a shared array. And so I have uh, an array A, and this is a two-dimensional array. So I imagine that I have a, at least one column per, per thread here. So every thread is going, to, is going to write some values, some which are all ones in this case, into a single column of that array. So what the code does is that it reads its thread number. So it calls OMP get thread num inside the parallel region. Uh, and because it's Fortran and we're going to access arrays, we add one to that. Okay. Um, so, and then we have a loop which loops over the elements of that column uh, and sets them all to one. Okay. So in terms of the variables here, so there's, there are four variables here. So let's have a look at them in turn. So we have i, which is the loop index. Um, so uh, that wants to be private. So every thread wants to have its own copy of the loop index so that, uh, so that they don't interfere with each other. So we, we don't want different threads trying to increment the loop index um, in, in some interleaved way. So uh, every thread gets its own copy of i. So i is in the private list. Next up is my ID. So that's where the thread ID is being stored. So that also needs to be private. So every thread needs to store its own value of that. So the other variables we have here are the array A. So we can make we can safely make A shared because different threads are going to write to different parts of that shared data structure. So making that shared is fine. There are no race conditions here. And then finally, we have 
the extent of the loop, which is n. And so n is not modified inside the body of the parallel region. So we want to make that shared. So there's no, there's no reason not to use the original value that existed already in n before this parallel region is encountered. And in fact, you know, just, as a, just to emphasize the point, if we made n private here, that would be incorrect code because I would then have an uninitialized copy on every thread. So you'll see that this uh, parallel directive is, uh, is, is split over two lines. Um, I'll come back and talk about how that works um, in, in Fortran and in, and in C uh, later. So don't worry about that too. All, the, all that means is that is I didn't have enough space on, on one line. So you can, uh, uh, and this tends to happen because if you want to specify, if you have a lot of variables, you tend to get long lines. So it's convenient to split your directives across multiple source code lines. So here we are. So this is how you do that. Um, so in Fortran, it depends whether you're uh, working fixed source form or free source form. So in fixed source form, then the ampersand goes on the end of the sentinel on the continuation line. So the second line and or any subsequent lines have to have exclamation mark dollar OMP ampersand at the beginning. Uh, in free source form, then the ampersand goes on the end of the first line and we don't have an ampersand in the, in the second line. So um, you just need to check because different compilers um, may have different default behavior here and it may depend on the file extension. In C and C++, we just use the normal mechanism for continuing uh, preprocessor directives, uh, which is to put a backslash and then continue without any other sentinels, without any new sentinels on, on the subsequent line. The important thing to note here is that you are not allowed to have any white space after the backslash. So the backslash must be the last character on the line. Uh, otherwise, the compiler gets confused and it tries to interpret the second line of the directive as C source code and will no doubt throw a bunch of incomprehensible errors uh, as it tries to do that. So typically, you don't get a nine message if you if you add white space after the backslash okay so a little bit more about private variables so if you remember we were talking about them earlier private variables are uninitialized at the start of the parallel region if we want to initialize them, then we can. And the way to do that is to use the first private clause instead of private. Okay, so the syntax is very similar. It's just first private instead of private, and then a comma separated list of variables in curly braces. Sorry, plain braces. Plain braces. What am I talking about? However, you should note that actually use cases, this are fairly uncommon. OK, so you can do it. Uh, what happens is that uh, the private copies are created and then they are initialized with the value that that variable had before the parallel region started. So whatever value that was in that variable uh, as the master thread reaches the parallel region, 
that value is copied into all the private copies on each thread. So you can do that. Um, if you, you feel you want to do that, then it's usually worth just thinking twice about what you're doing because, as I say, the, the number of times you really need this is relatively few. A few cases where it's, where it's useful, but mostly we don't need to do it. And say, if you have variables which are read-only access inside the parallel region, then it's fine just to make them shared. That has pretty much zero performance impact. Okay. You might think that make, making thread uh, first private um, copies of things which are read-only uh, might help performance. In practice, that's not true. So again, this also works for C++ objects. Um, so if it's a if the thing in the in the list here who is uh, is a C++ object, then the default copy constructor is called to, to create and initialize the new object uh, to existing uh, values from that from the uh, from the original object in the in the in the master thread. So here's an example uh, on this slide. It's a bit contrived because, as I said, it's it's quite difficult to to come up with um, convincing use cases that that uh, that fit on us that fit on a single slide. Um, but what happens here is we have um, a variable b here. So again, we're doing this kind of same sort of idea. We've got a, a, a two-dimensional array c here, and we're going to get every thread to in this case, form the sum of uh, the elements in in that uh, in in that. Well, this time, okay, okay, we'll think of it as a row because it's a a, a C array here. And um, so, what happens to this variable B here? Okay, so B is the thing that's going to be used to accumulate the sum, and um, it turns out that for, for whatever reason, we actually want to include the original value of B in that sum as well. Okay, so, what, so, so if B was assigned the value 23 before the parallel region started, then by saying first private B, what every thread will get a copy of B with an initial value of 23 in it. Uh, so it, inside the loop, every thread's accessing its own copy of B, which starts off as 23 and then gets values of C added to it. Uh, and then finally, that thing is used to um, assign the, the value into the last element of the row. So it's a bit of a strange piece of code, um, but uh, that's the idea. So there are, there are potentially some use cases where you want to first want a private copy on every thread but you want it to be initialized with the value that the variable had before the parallel region started. Okay, and the last thing I'm going to talk about here is reductions. So if you remember, reduction produces a single value from associative operations like addition, multiplication, um, max and min, logical and. Um, so in, in practice, by far the common use case is addition. So this is forming sums, um, common use case. The next common use case is probably maximums and minimums. If you want to. We want to uh, say find the maximum of the elements in an array, and you want to do that in parallel. Then reductions are, are are a good way of doing that as well. So if you remember from last week, the idea here, what we would like is each thread to accumulate or reduce into a private copy. Okay, so 
we're, we're trying to form a sum. We want every thread to form a partial sum in its own private copy of a variable and then add those all together at the end to give the final result. Um, so in both Fortran and C, the, the syntax is the same. Okay, so it's uh, so this is instead of saying shared or private or first private, we can so the fourth option for declaring this uh, variables on the end on parallel regions is reductions. So in this case, we say reduction. But in this case, we as well as the variables, we also have to specify the operator. So the syntax is in uh, embraces it's the operator uh, and then a colon and then the list of variables plus you can also treat arrays like this there is a special open mp syntax for specifying C, uh, C arrays or array sections in, uh, in OpenMP. Okay, so you, um, you can't use them in the actual code, but you can use this array syntax in, in OpenMP directives to specify um, uh, sections of, uh, of, of arrays. Um, so what happens if you, if you have an array, then essentially every element is treated point wise. So is that you get a for every element in the array, you get a private copy, uh, and then the sum of the private copies goes back into that element of the array. So it doesn't form the sum of the array. Okay, so that's um, that's that's what you might might uh, immediately think. It doesn't do that. It's a separate sum for every element in the array. Um, so here's an example. So here I want to, again, I want to, um, you know, using this same uh, idea again, I want to form the sum of uh, this time all the elements in this array. Okay? And I'm going to, to uh, get each thread to do a sum of a, a, of a different column. So inside the parallel region, again, I get my thread number, add one because it's Fortran, uh, and then loop over the column, forming the sum of the column. So before the parallel region, I give this an initial value. So I guess more typically it would be zero, but it might not, doesn't have to be. Okay. So in this case, B has the initial value 10. Okay. And then after the end of the parallel region, I get to use B. And uh, by the end of the parallel region, what I've got there is the value, the original value plus the sum of the entire row. So the way this works is by declaring B as in a reduction clause. So I say reduction open brackets plus colon B, close brackets. So I've, I've specified the operator that's going to be used to combine the private copies at the end. So what happens is when the parallel region starts, the value in the original variable is saved and remembered. Okay? So that's, that doesn't get, get uh, modified at this point. Each thread at the beginning of the parallel region and copy of B, and those private copies are automatically initialized to zero because that's what makes sense for additions. Okay, so the initialization depends on the operator. Um, so, for example, for multiplication, the it would be initialized to one. For max, for maximum. It would be initialized to uh, minus the largest representable number in the type. Um, so, uh, if you want to be formal about it, it's the initialization is to the identity element, so for the mathematical identity element for the op the corresponding to the operator. <laughs> 
Okay. Once we're inside the parallel region, any reference to B refers to those private copies. Uh, and there's no restriction on what we can do there. So um, we can, uh, as well as adding, adding things into B, then we can modify B in any way we like inside the parallel region. There's no restriction on, on what we do. All that we're guaranteed is that at the end of the parallel region, all the private copies are then added back into the original variable. So the final sum consists of the, the value before the parallel region started plus the sum of all the private copies. So when we come to look at parallel loops, this behavior makes a lot more sense. Or at least it's easy to understand why it works this way. Because it uh, essentially, it does the right thing with loops without you having to do any, um, to modify the code, except for adding the OpenMP directives. Okay, so I hope you all managed to successfully log on to our server Cirrus last week uh, and get the Hello World code compiled and running. So um, now you've got enough to get something more interesting going using a parallel region. And essentially uh, what the example is, is, is in, on the example sheet, the first example is to compute the area of the Mandelbrot set. Okay. So I'm sure, you, uh, sure you're all familiar with the, the famous fractal, which is uh, shown at the bottom of the bottom of the screen here. And despite it being a fractal, it does have a mathematically well-defined area. Um, but there is no known um, closed value for that. Okay, there's no theoretical result for its area. So essentially what we can do is if we can, if we sample the Mandelbrot set uh, finally enough, then we can, we can get an estimate of the area. So what the code does is it generates a grid of complex numbers in a box surrounding the set. And then it tests each number, each complex number, to see whether it's in the set or not. Uh, and then just by counting the ratio of the points inside to the total number of points uh, and multiplied by the area of the box gives us an estimate of the area. So this is a nice parallel problem because the testing of points is independent. Um, so we can parallelize with that with a parallel region. Um, however, we do need to form the sum of the points inside at the end. So um, you can use a reduction clause with the appropriate variable in it to, to form the sum at the end. Okay. So initially, I want I would really like you to do this uh, just using the functionality that I've described so far. So that means that I have to calculate uh, separate loop bands for every thread. Okay, so we have essentially a loop which runs over this grid. Uh, so we want to uh, calculate for each thread where the outermost loop is going to start and finish so that every thread does a different set of iterations of the loop. So in order to do that, we'll, we need to find out how many threads there are so that we can divide the number of loop iterations up between threads and then also find the identity of each thread so that each thread can calculate its start and end point for the loop. Okay, so that's the end of this lecture. Um, does anybody uh, have a question? A, a question in the chat panel from one of the listeners querying on slide 15, you had said B initialized to zero. 
they weren't sure if that made sense. Yes. Okay, great. Um, yes, it does. Okay. <laughs> does it make sense? Um, yeah, that's kind of odd. Let me, let me pick up slide 15 again here. Okay, so if you'll forgive me, I don't go full screen here for just for now. Okay, so that's, yes, okay, okay. Yeah, so why does each thread get, a, why does each thread's private copy get initialized to zero? Okay, so essentially what we want in each thread's private copy is a partial sum. So uh, this, the, the alternative would be to initialize it to the current value, but then we would get, uh, then when we come to sum those together at the end, we would include that value once for every thread, which is, uh, which is not what we want. As I say, when, you, when we come to doing this with loops, you'll see why this, this behavior is, you'll, it'll be easy to understand why this behavior is like that, okay? It's, uh, so every private copy, gets uh, a th is, is initialized to zero. So every thread forms this partial sum and then the original value is only added in once and not once for every thread. Because otherwise then the result would just depend on the number of threads that you had and that wouldn't be, uh, wouldn't really give you what you wanted. Does B have to be initialized? Yes, it does. Okay, so the original value, so the original value in the in the uh, in, in the master thread must be initialized. Is, otherwise, you would also in, that value always gets included in the final sum. So that definitely has to be initialized. As I say, more typically, you would initialize that to zero. Okay, if you're just wanting to to form the sum of something in parallel then you, it, would be, it would be normal to, uh, to initialize the, uh, the original thing to zero. Um, I just didn't want to do that in the example just to make, make the point that it doesn't have to be. It, gets, it takes whatever value it, it has, it currently has. But initializing to zero would, would be the more common use case. Yes, so 10 will be added to the total. Okay. So the, the, what you get at the end is the sum of the original value, in this case 10, plus all the private copies. So yes, the private copy initialization depends on the operator. So if the operator were, were multiplication, the private copies would be initialized to 1. And if the operator is max, then the private copies will be initialized to um, the largest possible negative number in the type. So the Mandelbrot set example is um, a much more classical use case. So that should make, should make a whole lot more sense um, for that. Great, do we have any other questions? Okay, great. So in that case, uh, we'll take a break now and we'll come back again at 3.30 for the next session, which is about work sharing and parallel loops. Okay, welcome back everyone. So um, uh, let me just take a moment to uh, project full screen and then we'll uh, get, uh, get going again. Okay, so here we go. Um, now going to move on to talk about work sharing directives in OpenMP. So, so far we've just looked at plain old parallel regions and parallel regions are the basic way of creating threads and we've seen that we can do useful things by getting different threads to do different computations inside parallel regions. Now we come to work sharing directives. So this is a mechanism by which we can say, actually, we don't want every thread to replicate all the code inside a parallel region. 
we want to share it out some way. And the main reason for doing this, then the most strong motivation, is to be able to parallelize loops. So we, we would like to be able to say, OK, we're inside a parallel region. There are multiple threads executing. But we don't want every thread to execute all the iterations. We want to share the iterations out between the threads. So that's what I'm mostly going to be talking about in this session. But there's also another couple of things as well. There's also a single and master directive, which I'll come to at the end. So let's start off by talking about parallel loops. So loops are the most common source of parallelism in most code. So parallel loop directives turn out to be really important. So particularly in scientific code, I wouldn't mind betting that about 98% of all open MP directives in, uh, in real codes are, are actually loop directives. It turns out that this is what we end up doing most of the time to parallelize codes with OpenMP. So how does this work? Well, it's basically just how I've indicated. So a parallel do or for loop in OpenMP divides the iterations of the loop between the threads. And the way this works is that the loop directive appears inside a parallel region and immediately before the loop and indicates that the work in the loop should be shared out between the threads instead of being replicated, which is what would happen by default. In addition, there is a synchronization point at the end of the loop. So if we do this, all threads must finish their iterations before any thread can proceed. Uh, and start executing subsequent code inside the parallel region. So here's the syntax for the loop directives. So in Fortran, it's OMP do, followed by the do loop. And then optionally, you can put an OMP end do directive after the loop. Uh, so that's not necessary. Uh, the compiler is able to perfectly happily determine where the loop ends. Uh, this is really just for programming style convenience. So in, in Fortran, it's quite, it's quite nice, I think, to, to use end do directives so that you always have OpenMP directives in pairs, to which, uh, so which clearly eliminates, del del clearly eliminates the, the block code that, uh, that the directive refers to. CMC++, the directive is hash pragma OMP4, and that's immediately followed by a for loop. So, and in particular, so the for loop must not be enclosed in curly braces here. So the next line really must be a for statement uh, and not inside curly braces. So for Fortran loops, this is all quite clear and, and, and obvious because the, uh, the do uh, construct in, in Fortran um, is, is quite straightforward and, and restrictive in what it does. In C++ is a bit different. So this is because the for loop in C is actually a general while loop, um, just uh, dressed up in some, in, in some other syntax. Um, and so there are restrictions on, on the form it can take if we're going to apply an OpenMP parallel loop directive to it. So the main rule here is it has to have a determinable trip count. What does that mean? It means that the number of iterations must be possible to calculate before the loop starts. So it doesn't have to be known at compile time. But when the code is running, the OpenMP runtime must be able to calculate how many iterations there will be before the loop starts executing. So we're restricted to the sort of classical form that we're all used to writing. So it looks like for some variable equals some value, 
and then the second part of the for block is var less than less than or equal greater than or greater than or equal to some other value some other expression b uh, and then an expression for incrementing var so that can be var plus plus it's the most common one or it can be var equals var plus or minus some element. The other restriction we have is we're not allowed to modify var inside the loop body. So that's allowable in general C for loops. But if we want to use OpenMP to parallelize the loop, then we're not allowed to do that either. OK, so here's a really canonical example of a parallel loop. So what we're doing here is we're calculating some values in an array B, uh, and these depend on some values in another array A. So this is a classical example of a parallelizable loop because every iteration of the loop writes to a different location in B, which means that all the loop iterations are independent so it doesn't matter what order they're executed in we're going to get the same result uh, and so we can also therefore share the loop iterations out between threads so how does this work so well we have to be inside a parallel region and then we apply the do or for directive in front of the loop. And that says, instead of every thread executing the entire loop, the loop iterations will be shared out between threads. So the pattern is so common that there's a shorthand form which combines the parallel region and the loop directive together into a single line. So this is convenient, but it's also quite confusing as well. So the pattern on the previous slide, so let me go back to that again. So let's just look at that again. So in, in Fortran, we have a parallel followed by a do, and then at the end, we have end do followed by parallel. And in C, C++, we have hash pragma OMP parallel, and then the only thing inside the parallel region is a loop with the OMP4 directive in front of it. So this is the pattern we need to parallelize a loop. Let's say this is so common that there is a shorthand way of doing that, which is to combine the parallel region and the loop directive into a single directive. So in Fortran, this looks like OMP parallel do and optionally end parallel do at the end, or in C and C++, hash pragma OMP parallel for. And again, what follows the parallel for directive is just the for loop, so no curly braces around the outside. So I say this is convenient, but it is a bit confusing. So you must keep in mind that a parallel region, a for or do directive, and a parallel do or parallel for directive are three different things. So the third thing, the one we've got here, is a contraction of the other two together. So none of them are interchangeable. So we can also apply some clauses to the loop directive. So we can either use private or first private and reduction clauses, which refer just to the scope of the loop. Okay, so they can change whatever we have on the parallel region for that variable. We can change the behavior with respect to the loop. So actually the most common use case here is reductions. So it's quite common to want to do, to say form the sum of a variable in a parallel loop and then use the result after the loop 
but still inside the parallel region. So that means that it's no good to apply the reduction clause to the parallel region because we want the result of the reduction. We want the sum to happen when the loop ends and not necessarily wait until the parallel region ends. So that's probably the most common use case. The parallel loop index variable is made private by default. So anything else really makes no sense at all because you would have a race condition with different threads trying to update the loop variable. So the index variable of the parallel loop and because of the restrictions in C++, that thing is well defined for loops in C and C++. That's made private by default. What happens to other loop indices depends on the base language. So they are private by default in Fortran, but not in C or C++. Most of the time, that doesn't really matter because in modern C, C++, what people tend to do is declare the loop index variable just for the scope of the loop. So by doing that, you do make it private. So it's common to say, you know, for int i equals etc. in C. So if the declaration comes as part of the for uh, statement, then that or that also automatically prioritizes that variable because by the rule that we talked about last time, that variables declared inside the parallel region are private by default. So the combined directive, the combined parallel do or parallel for directive can also take all the clauses that are available for the parallel directive, as you might expect. But as I said before, okay, parallel do or for is not the same as do or for, and also it's nor is it the same as parallel. It's the combination of it's the combination of both together. So if we don't specify anything else, how does the loop directive partition the iterations? And the answer is it'll do it as equally as possible between the threads. So and in the general case, the number of loop iterations will not be exactly divisible by the number of threads. So there will be a remainder. And how the remainder is handled is actually implementation dependent. So, for example, suppose we had a loop with seven iterations and we had three threads. So that could either get partitioned as three on the first thread, three on the second thread, and one on the last thread. Or an equally valid partition would be three on the first, two on the second, and two on the third. So the OpenMP specification doesn't actually tell you which of those options is going to happen. It doesn't tell you how the remainder is going to be handled. Um, in practice, I think almost all implementations do the first thing. Okay, so the remainder is filled up to the left rather than equally divided between, uh, between the remaining threads. So that's fine. So as long as all, as long as we expect all the loop iterations to take the same amount of time, then the default behavior is what we want. We want to try and give an equal amount of work as possible to every thread, in which case we expect them to each thread to finish their loop iterations at more or less the same time, so that we don't waste any time with threads being idle waiting for other threads. So remember that there's this synchronization point at the end of the loop. So we don't want threads to be waiting idle at that point because some threads have more iterations than others. So the remainders, the default behavior is to give an equal number of iterations to every thread so that they will, if, the, if every iteration takes about the same time, 
then the, all the threads will finish the loop at about the same time. So the question then arises, what happens if we have a loop where the iterations don't take the same amount of time? So this is where we start wanting to use the schedule clause on the loop directive. Uh, and this gives a variety of options for specifying which loops are executed by which thread. So the syntax here is, so this is a clause which appears after the do or for directive and uh, it's schedule and then we have a kind and then optionally a chunk size. And the kind can be one of either static, dynamic, guided, auto, or runtime. And I'll explain what all those do as we go along. And chunk size is some integer expression with. So what do these various different options do? If no chunk size is specified and we have a static schedule, then we essentially get the default behavior. The iteration space is divided into approximately equal chunks, and one chunk is assigned to each thread in order. So if you like, that's a block schedule. So we exactly one chunk of iterations per thread. Thread zero gets the first chunk. So the first chunk of iterations goes to thread zero, the next chunk goes to thread one, and so on. If we do specify a chunk size, then the iteration space is also divided into chunks, but this time they're smaller, okay? So typically each of that number of iterations and the chunks are assigned cyclically to each thread. This is a block cyclic schedule. So this is maybe easier to understand with pictures. So let me move on to the slide with pictures. So here I'm imagining that what I have is a loop with 46 iterations and that's running with four threads. So if I specify schedule static, which is the default behavior, okay, so four goes into 46 with, with a remainder. So what will happen is that first three threads will get 12 iterations and thread three will get the remaining 10. If we specify a chunk size, so on the lower diagram, if we say schedule static comma four, then what happens is the loop is divided up into chunks of four iterations. So the first four go to thread zero, the next four to thread one, the next four to thread two, the next four to thread three, and then we cycle back through again. So it's always in the deterministic order. So we go thread zero, one, two, three, zero, one, two, three, and so on until we get to the end of the loop. So in this case, if the number of loop iterations by, does not divide exactly by the chunk size, which is again the case here, four does not go exactly into 46, then the last chunk will be smaller. So in this case, the last chunk that goes to thread three will only have two iterations in it. All the other chunks will consist of four iterations. So the next option we have is a dynamic schedule. So this also divides the iteration space up into chunks of size, chunk size. But instead of doing this static cyclic decomposition, dynamic assigns the chunks to threads on a first come first serve basis. So essentially what happens is it keeps track of which is the next chunk of iterations that needs to be done. So whichever thread happens to finish it, its chunk first, it will grab the next one off the list. So yeah, as a thread finishes a chunk, it will get assigned the next chunk in the list 
Um, so uh, depending on how long each thread takes to do each chunk, we may get different, you know, we, we may get different assignments of, of, of chunks to threads. If we don't specify a chunk size here, then it defaults to one. So we default to, to a dynamic schedule where every single iteration can be scheduled to the next thread in turn that finishes its previous one. So the next option is called guided. Uh, and this is similar to dynamic in that it's also a first come first served process. But instead of all the chunks being the same size, the chunks start off large and get smaller exponentially. So the rule here is that the size of the next chunk is proportional to the number of remaining iterations so the ones that haven't been executed or haven't been started yet, divided by the number of threads. So the OpenMP standard doesn't specify the constant of proportionality here, but the value that all, all implementations that I know of use is one half. So to calculate the size of the next chunk, it, the, uh, we look at the number of remaining iterations we divide by the number of threads and then multiply that by a half. And that's the number that will be in the next chunk. So in this case, the chunk size parameter has a different meaning. All it does is specify the minimum size of the chunks. So, and again, if we don't specify it, it defaults to one. So with no chunk size specified, the chunks get smaller and smaller until the last few will be size one. Uh, otherwise, if the chunk size in, then the, then, it, then the chunks never get smaller than that. So let's go back to our favorite loop again with 46 iterations. So this time, if we say specify schedule as dynamic three, we will divide the loop up into chunks of three iterations this time. And so the first four chunks will be assigned to different threads. And then say, for example, thread one, which is the black thread, finishes its first chunk first. It will grab the next one in sequence. Uh, and then the gray thread finishes, so it gets the next one in sequence and so on. So whichever half thread happens to finish its chunk, it grabs the next one. Um, so it might happen, for instance, that a thread uh, gets two sequential chunks. So we can see that with the, that's what happens if, with the uh, hatched thread in the middle here. So it just so happened that those particular iterations maybe were very quick to execute. So that thread also became the next thread that in, in line as well. So we've got two chunks in a row. If we specify uh, the schedule as guided with a chunk size of three, then we get something like the bottom picture here. So the chunks start off large and then they get successively smaller and smaller. But because we specify the chunk size of three, they never get smaller than three. Yet another option is auto. So this is just a mechanism for saying, OK, I really don't know what to choose here. I'll let the runtime decide. So this is a mechanism for letting OpenMP implementation have full freedom to choose whatever it does to do an assignment of iterations to threads. So essentially, this is a way for allow OpenMP implementations to do something else. Okay, so. Um, and you will probably need to read the documentation for a particular compiler to figure out what it does. One idea that this can do is that if the parallel loop's executed many times, the runtime can evolve a good schedule which has good load balance and good load and low overhead. So the idea here is that the if, if you specify auto, the the runtime can learn from previous executions of the same loop. Uh, do a better and do a better job as the as the program progresses. 
So that's a lot of options. Um, when do we do which? Well, as long as we have load balance loops, then we should just choose static, the default behavior. That's the best option because it has the least amount of overhead associated with it. Static with a chunk size tends to be good for loops which have relatively mild or smooth load imbalance. So what I mean that is that the, the amount of work changes relatively slowly with the iteration. Um, so that's when static tends to work reasonably well. It can also in, induce some overheads. So a chunk size of one is not always necessarily the best. Um, I'll come back and discuss when we talk about performance in the last set of lectures. I'll come back and, and discuss reasons why that, at least one reason why that might be. Um, so in general, you have to experiment with the chunk size to find the best option for a given loop. So dynamic is best when, if the iterations have really widely varying loads. And so if we have a loop where some loop iterations take hundred times or a thousand times longer to execute than other loop iterations, then that's when dynamic comes in because that does the best job of, of balancing the load. It comes with overheads, though there are overheads associated with scheduling the chunks and it also tends to ruin any data locality. And again, I'll talk about the important data locality uh, in, in week four. Guided is meant to be a bit of a compromise. It's, uh, it has lower overheads than dynamic, but it, uh, it won't work for loops where the first iterations are the most expensive because the first iterations all go into a big chunk. Um, so that may take longer than all the rest of the iterations put together and you don't get good load balance. So auto may be useful if the loop's executed many times over, or it may just be a way of implementations providing you with yet another option. Uh, and that isn't one of the ones that's, that's, that's specified by OpenMP. Okay, so that's loops. Oh, I forgot to mention runtime. Okay, so we can say run, schedule runtime is just a convenient mechanism for experimenting. So if what happens then is that the actual loop schedule, so whether it's static or dynamic and whatever chunk size you want, you can specify that in an environment variable before executing the code. Okay? And then you can pick that up. So that's just a a convenient way of, of experimenting without having to recompile your code. Uh, but you should never leave that in uh, in production code because you're, you don't want to rely on users setting it. So it's really just a, a, a tool for, for doing development and choosing a good, a good schedule without having to compile your code lots of times. Good, so that's our loops. Say, and as I say, that's what we end up doing an awful lot of time with OpenMP code. Most of the OpenMP, OpenMP you're likely to write is, is parallel loops of one sort or another. So there's a couple of other work sharing directives I wanted to mention before we finish today. And the first of these is the single directive. So sometimes when we're inside a parallel region, we actually have a block of code that we actually only want one thread to execute. What singles for? It says this block of code, okay, don't, don't have it executed by every thread. One thread will execute it, and so it will be the first, that will typically be the first thread that comes to the single directive, will execute the bottom block of code. All the other threads skip over and wait for the block to finish. So there is a synchronization point at the end of the block. All the other threads wait 
until the block's been executed. So there are no surprises in the syntax. In Fortran, it looks like single, a block of code, and n single, and C and C++, hash pragma, OMP single, and then a structured block of code. So again, that's either a single statement or a block of code in curly braces. So one of the use cases for single is to do file IO. So for example, if you are in the middle of a parallel region and you're at a point where you want to read some data from a file, it's usually convenient to have only one thread do that. So that's what's going on in this example here. So uh, in the code on the left-hand side here, I have a parallel region. So every thread, and I have a couple of data structures. I don't know what they are. Uh, they might be arrays. They might be some other, something else called X and Y. So the first thing that's going to happen is that uh, every thread is going to call the setup function on X. Uh, and then we're going to read Y from a file. So that's done inside the input function. Uh, and then once that's done, then every thread can call work using both X and Y. So the way this works is that, so every thread uh, does, uh, does call setup first thread that finishes setup will go into the single region and call input. The other threads, when they finish setup, they will wait. So the other threads will be idle until the single region has finished. So until the call to input is completed. Uh, and then at that point, all the threads carry on and execute work. So it's unusual to require it. You can also make, you can also have private and first private variables, which are scoped in the single. And say so with as with a lot of open MP uh, constructs, the the structured block really must be a structured block. So what does that mean? It means you can't run, branch into or out of it. So the control flow for that block of code must go in at the top and come out at the bottom. You can't arbitrarily jump out of this kind of code. And this is this will be true of uh, other things we'll look at uh, later on as well. This is a common common restriction in OpenMP, where we have a, uh, a block of code associated with the directive. You can't branch in or out of it. That's true of parallel regions as well. And then the final thing I want to talk about is the master directive. So this indicates that a block of code should be executed by the master thread only. This is a bit like single, but instead of saying the first thread that gets there executes it, it says that thread zero executes it and all the others don't. So there's a little bit of weird asymmetry here because for the master directives, there's no synchronization at the end of the block. The other heads just skip the block and carry on in executing. So it's different from single. So single says the first thread that gets there executes it. The other threads wait. Master says thread zero executes it, and the other threads just carry on. So that's it's uh, it's a little bit strange. I'm I'm not quite sure why. This was designed like this originally in, in OpenMP. It, it just looks slightly odd that there's this, that there's this asymmetry between these two. Okay. So again, no surprises with the syntax. Okay, hey, so what you can do next, okay, so I'd really like you to do the first exercise first and do the Mandelbrot example without using the work sharing directives. And 
because hopefully that will give you a really good grounding in understanding how parallel regions work. Um, in practice, it's much easier to do it with a, with a work sharing directive. So uh, that's what I'd like you to do next. Once you've done the version with just using parallel region and calls to OMP get thread num and OMP get num threads, do it again, but use a parallel region and a, a work sharing directive. Uh, and you'll see that effectively what the work sharing directive is, is, is doing all that stuff for you that you have to do, you otherwise have to do by hand to divide up the iterations of the loop between the threads. Okay. Does anybody have any questions? So I'm sure you'll start having some questions when you start doing the, the practical exercises. Um, so please post on the on, on the chat page, and I'll be I'll be looking at that and uh, and trying to answer all your questions uh, until next week when when we'll meet again. Ah, good question. How do you specify chunk size in the runtime scheduler? What you do is is you do this. Okay, so I'll I'll, I'll just type it. I'll type it rather than try to explain it. So as an environment as an environment variable before the before you run your code, you can do something like this. You can say export OMP schedule equals dynamic comma four, for example. Great. Thank you very much for listening, everybody. And I'll speak to you again next week.